Morgan. Yeah. Our next speaker is Yan Yiru from uh, the Duke University. This work is part of his uh, master thesis. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, my name is Dan. You may not recognize me without my sloppy ears. Um, but I've been working with Dan Lushinsky about uh, collision detection. That seems it works. Immediately fails. All right. So the first, the first thing to note about collision detection is that it is an extremely diverse field. So if, for example, I wanted to simulate a uh, scene with um, all kinds of everyday objects, I um, would probably have to distinguish between different cases. For example, uh, we have approaches suitable to objects which are part of the environment, and we have uh, solutions which are suitable for fast-moving objects, and uh, if I know that some of the objects are convex, then I can take advantage of that, with suitable approaches for that, and uh, I might have to consider objects that are procedurally generated, and I can't, you know, you know I can't, uh, I don't know what they are in advance. And, uh, I also have to think about the number of faces of the uh, geometry and <clears throat> also the number of instances and so on. And so our focus is the following case. We have pre known rigid bodies that are not very geometry dependent um, and we also uh, can't handle too many dis different distinct meshes, but uh, we can handle a large amount of instances of these objects. Okay, so this is a specific kind of collision detection for rigid bodies and not even going into non-rigid bodies, right? That's a whole different field. And um, when we're dealing with so many instances, uh, we have to keep in mind the uh, time frame, right? So uh, we have about 20 milliseconds between um, updates of a video game which are our main application, because that's my interest. And um, that time has to suffice for everything. So uh, that includes any game logic, or uh, AI rendering, and physics, and within physics, collision detection. So any solution which is uh, in the neighborhood of one millisecond per a single collision, that's a big problem. So we're here to accelerate that. I'm going to focus my talk about five, like uh, the big topics, and <clears throat> the first one being that we're using the penetration volume, and I'll explain what that is and mainly why that is. And the second is generalizing this um, penetration volume to um, a, a broader function, and then I'll talk a bit about what we did in offline and what we did at runtime, and um, then what kind of speed you can expect using similar methods after some optimization. All right. So like uh, virtually all uh, time-critical applications, we're taking the discrete approach to, the, to collision detection, which means uh, we don't try to prevent objects from colliding in advance, rather we wait until it's cheaper to detect that they have already entered interpenetrated and uh, handle it then. But that does require that we have some measure of their interpenetration. So the, uh, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, very roughly speaking, I will distinguish between penetration depth and penetration volume. Now penetration depth is actually like a big name for all kinds of penetration depth, but um, you can think of them as um, like a distance, a one-dimensional distance in some space, and the penetration volume is obviously, you know, the volume occupied by those bodies. So, uh, the first advantage of using the penetration volume, in my opinion, is um, on the intuition side. Uh, I think that most people would agree that looking at the left-hand figure here, uh, there's like more perceived interpenetration and we, we would probably expect the physics engine to prioritize dealing with that, with what, that configuration over the right one uh, but on the other hand penetration depth with, which deals with the depth of penetration uh, would yield the same results for both because they do penetrate to the same depth okay so uh, the second 
consideration is the physical one. So we all know that uh, a body that floats in a liquid is repulsed by the liquid at a force determined by the volume uh, within the water, so that's basically the penetration volume. And we might also want to speak about rigid bodies, which are known to not really be rigid, because this uh, a golf ball, uh, which is an actual golf ball, actually has to change its volume in order for forces to be applied. So uh, that change in volume is comparable to the penetration volume in our simulation, where objects are indeed rigid. And then there is a matter of continuity. Most, not all, but most penetration depth measures are uh, suffering from some incontinuities. And there are even you know, papers trying to approach that and address that from all kinds of directions. But penetration volume is inherently continuous. And that leads to the fourth bullet, which is that um, it is very easy to define a potential function over the penetration volume, which then you know, gives rise to um, resolution methods that want to uh, reduce the, the, the potential function. Okay, so that's the first big point, uh, using the penetration volume. Now, in order to uh, address the uh, large amount of instances, we're taking the offline approach. That means that we take two measures that we know of in advance, two rigid bodies, and we sample many samples in the configuration space. And the configuration space is mainly used in uh, motion planning, uh, but has been already uh, used a bit for uh, simulations. And it is uh, the six-dimensional non-Euclidean space where each point corresponds to a, a translation <coughs> and rotation of one body relative to the other. So we can sample many configurations such as these in this uh, configuration space and then store that in the database and in runtime you can use the database to you know, estimate uh, the data that we need for a given configuration. Now, uh, when I say sampling the configuration space, what exactly are we sampling? So that depends on the conf configuration. If it is an intersecting configuration, then we can construct, and indeed construct, the uh, intersection polyhedron. We can compute its volume and also compute it, its uh, center of mass. Now, this center of mass will later help us um, determine where to apply penalty forces. As far as I know, this is the first work to actually try to address the matter of um, contact areas in advance, in pre-processing. Uh, so we do that, and if the uh, configuration is disjoint, then we can um, compute the sphere, which is the smallest sphere that touches both bodies, and its volume negated would be the negative penetration volume assigned to this configuration. And the center of the sphere would be the contact point, although there is no actual contact. Uh, now, this is uh, not a very complex definition, but it um, broadens, the, broadens the scope of the penetration volume to a function over the configuration space, which is very convenient. It's zero, exactly zero, at exact contact. It's positive on the inside, and it's negative on the outside, and it's well behaved and pretty to look at, and apart from being pretty to look at, it's also uh, convenient for interpolation and extrapolation. Okay, so that's the second main point. And uh, as for generating the database of samples. So the premise of this work is that we're not really interested in all of the configurations. First of all, disjoint configurations, uh, we don't need to handle them because there is nothing to handle. The bodies are disjoint. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, we don't expect to deal with very deep penetration of the object if we can prevent that in the first place. So that leaves us with wanting to sample more densely in the neighborhood of 
touching configurations. Now, these touching configuration contact configurations are more formally named uh, the contact space, which is a five-dimensional manifold within the six-dimensional configuration space. Right. So, uh, how do we address that? Uh, first, we create some kind of a data a test set, and then we generate random anchors. Anchors are well, the random configurations or super random because they throw away uh, configurations that are two that are on the disjoint side and too distant from the contact space and therefore deemed too irrelevant for uh, estimation near contact. But that doesn't leave us uh, with very close contact to the uh, contact space, so uh, we then create threads, which is uh, like a process of propagating uh, from the anchors towards the contact space. So I'll try to explain the basics of threading. Uh, here we have a single anchor, and for simplification you'll um, forgive me for presenting only one translation axis and one rotation axis, instead of three and three. Right. So, um, this green thing here is uh, an estimate or an exact computation of the translational distance. That is, given the anchor, which is a certain configuration, right? uh, given the anchor, uh, how much we would trans uh, need to translate by the minimum amount one of the bodies so that they reach a contact configuration. And if we do that, if we have that, and we do have that, and we can also estimate a gradient in the six-dimensional space uh, of the penetration, generalized penetration volume function, then that would direct us towards the contact space, and if we could go in that direction, the same green amount, then hopefully we'd reach the other side of the contact space. Uh, that's because surely the distance in the full six-dimensional space uh, to the contact space is not bigger than uh, the um, translational distance. Um, we might also want to trim down the angle a bit if we went too far uh, on the angle side. Now, this did require that we have some kind of operation of resizing the gradient to a certain size, right? And this is not Euclidean space. We, uh, we're facing all kinds of these small problems that require filling the mathematical holes, but you get the idea. Alright, so we read some configuration, hopefully it's on the other side, it doesn't have to be on the other side, or just right now, and that's the next configuration in the thread, and the thread continues, and for each such sample, apart from sampling it exactly and storing it in a database, which is the main point, we also estimate it, and once the estimation is accurate enough, uh, the thread is considered converged. So that's just a single thread, and then we can do that uh, concurrently for multiple uh, threads, and if we uh, extinguish all of the anchors and we create new anchors, and the process continues until such time that we uh, that some seven measures of precision have converged continuously um, over the test set. All right. So that's the creation of database, and that's the third main point. And as for the, as some results for that. So here we see 23 randomly selected threads, each depicted by a line, and you can see on the left that they each begin with some uh, random penetration volume, and within one or two iterations uh, it reaches a much uh, low penetration volume, meaning closer to contact, and if we we'll zoom in, we'll see that they even indeed uh, zigzag like, uh, across the uh, two sides of the contact space, which is good for estimating near the contact space. Uh, they also converge um, like in about uh, 10 iterations, okay, they are not that big. Uh, here I'm showing all the contact points of a certain database of bunny versus bunny, and in green are the contact points of configurations which are near contact. So uh, this method allows us to reach a reasonably good coverage of the surface of the body, of the bunny, and indeed uh, 62 percent of the samples were considered here near contact. All right. So as for runtime, at runtime we have a given configuration, and we want to estimate three measures. 
The first is a penetration volume that would help us um, determine the magnitude of a penalty force. The second is the contact point and that would allow us to determine where to apply the forces. And the third is uh, determining the direction of the penalty force. And uh, the penetration volume translation gradient would help us help us with that. Uh, I'm not going uh, within the slides into the subject of the simulation layer, which is a complete other layer uh, on top of this one. But uh, this one, this one, we do want for that. You will note that everything I'm about to describe is CPU-based, and that has two advantages. Uh, the first is that well, it's not GPU-based, so uh, we are free to use the GPU for uh, other uh, applications, and that's again because the GPU is more commonly the bottleneck in video games. Uh, the second is that we can parallelize our approach, which is um, well, we can parallelize the four cores or the four. The, you know, the amount of cores that you have, and we do parallelize it, and uh, that's that. So what I'm showing you here is like on a single core, we have a new configuration on the left here that we want to estimate properties for. And we have two of ten nearest neighbors that we found from the database, or approximate nearest neighbors, for which we know the penetration volume, right? So if we can, like determine a line that goes through them. And again, I'm reminding that this is non Euclidean space, uh, but everything is like geometry inspired. So if we can determine a line going through these, and if we can uh, think about the projection point of the new configuration on that line, then we can talk about linearly interpolating or extrapolating the PV, the penetration volume values to the projection point, and that would uh, yield uh, some guess by these two, and if we do that for every pair of uh, neighbors from the 10 that we have, which is 10 choose 2, 45 pairs, we have 45 guesses, and we have a weighted average of them, and that's the total guess. <coughs> and pretty much the same goes for the contact point, since we stored that as well. For example, we did the same process only for our 3D vector. And uh, here I took a real-world example of a configuration on the left and searched for the nearest neighbors in a pre-built database, um, which are shown in blue. The green dots are the estimation, that is to say each green dot is determined by two blue dots, and the weighted average of the green dots is a pink dot, while the red one is the exact point of so this is uh, approximately how it is. All right, I'm not going to talk about uh, the gradient estimation. It has a different uh, you know, method, but it is basically also geometry inspired. It requires a, a definition of some operator, operators. And I will say that the main point is that it doesn't require any more data than we already got. So. Um, Getting the 10 nearest neighbors has already cost us a few precious microseconds. So uh, we're not paying any more for that, and we're using the same neighbors uh, to estimate the gradient, so we get it basically for free. Now for some results, um, I'm showing here a comparison between us on the right and three other works. Uh, the first on the left, by a large scale, uh, is a GPU-based approach, and I'm showing the, like, the minimal costs reported in the paper uh, by uh, blue and in green the maximum costs. So uh, the first work is by far the most versatile out of the, out of the four and um, it also is the most uh, costly. Right? And uh, the second work by Weller et al. is uh, state-of-the-art penetration volume estimation method which is CPU based and not GPU based like the first one. Um, it does uh, use only a single core, so I allow myself to divide all results by four, so it will be comparable to uh, my display results. Okay. Uh, so that's that, and then we have oh, sorry, and then we have Panetal, uh, which is dealing with penetration depth, and it uh, uses an offline approach, which in a different manner 
samples uh, the configuration space and gives an estimate of penetration depth. And uh, then we have us, us on the right. Uh, you might want me to zoom in a little bit. So uh, here is the scope of 700 microseconds. You can see us here with this river. And uh, if we zoom in further, uh, you see I've, I've recorded um, results of uh, 5 to 15 microseconds per collision when averaged over uh, many collisions using four cores. Now, uh, everything I'm about to show, simulations, the simulations I'll, I'll show, are using the precision level for the VAC 5 microseconds, right? So uh, the 15 microseconds is mostly like uh, for academic purposes and, and numeric results uh, I'm showing in the paper. Okay, so <clears throat> that's that. And now for a little demonstration of the uh, two you know, identical scenes, but uh, one using the uh, approximate penetration volume and one using the exact penetration volume. The precision level is the five microseconds precision level, like I said, and I think most people will be hard pressed to uh, see any significant differences. Let's see if the volume works. So that's a few guests. Uh, this is like a GPU intensive scene, so it demonstrates uh, that we uh, allow the GPU to do all kinds of stuff while we, we use a CPU. Here we have a chocolate colored armadillo. Ar 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 Uh, in the paper, 
suggested ways of drastically improving that, but we just didn't see uh, enough need because it's not, not too bad. Yeah. How long does it take to create the database? Right, so that's an, another big point. Um, well, you know, we're showing an approach and the uh, specific times for the pre-processing is really depending on the methods you use to construct the uh, intersection polyhedron, which takes like 95% of the pre-processing. And uh, we're using uh, a library named Carve, and uh, that takes about uh, a few tens of milliseconds per uh, polyhedron. So it took us um, between uh, 45 uh, minutes to an hour, a bit more than that, to construct a single database. But again, uh, in like future work directions, uh, there is a, you can use uh, libraries which are uh, much more faster, although they are also <coughs> approximate, and like SOFA, and I can provide more details of how to do this um, faster. Yeah. The term is pretty good. Well, uh, yeah. The term is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really good. Yeah. If I understand correctly, you basically kind of uh, Yeah, yeah. Can you say something maybe about the uh, accuracy? Right. So. Uh